In this video, I'll give an overview of how replication is initiated in eukaryotes and mention some essential mechanisms that regulate this process. To start, I want to briefly review the eukaryotic cell cycle, which is characterized by four main stages. In the G1 phase, the cell is growing and carrying out normal metabolic activity. In the S phase, DNA replication occurs. This is followed by G2 phase, in which the cell continues to grow and prepares for cell division. And then, of course, M phase, or mitosis, is when the cell divides into two daughter cells. In general, the progression through the different stages of the cell cycle is controlled by cyclin-dependent kinases. Specific cyclin proteins are expressed at different phases of the cell cycle, and the cyclins control which kinases are active in each phase. Replication is confined to the S phase of the cycle, and it's important that replication is completed before the cycle continues. Stalled replication forks prevent progression of the cycle. It's also important that replication is not initiated more than one time at any replication origin in a given cell cycle. Generally speaking, eukaryotes have much larger genomes than bacteria spread over multiple chromosomes. So to complete the task of DNA replication in a reasonable length of time, we need multiple replication origins. The bright areas in this figure uh, represent newly synthesized DNA. From 30,000 to 50,000 origins fire in a typical cell cycle in humans. It's hard to find eukaryotic replication origins just through sequence analysis, though there seems to be a preference for regions with low nucleosome concentration. To prevent an origin from firing more than once in a cell cycle, initiation is divided into two stages. Licensing, during which two helicase complexes are localized to the origin, and activation. The process of licensing is summarized here. An important group of proteins is the origin recognition complex, or ORC. This is a heterohexamer. MCM is another heterohexamer composed of subunits labeled uh, 2 through 7. Two helper proteins called CDC6 and CDT1 are also involved. So the basic steps are listed on the left. First, the ORC complex binds to the origin. Then, CDC6 binds and then a complex of CDT1 and MCM binds, and the helicase is loaded onto the double-stranded DNA. The protein hexamer actually surrounds the double helix. Then an ATP hydrolysis event causes CDC6 and CDT1 to dissociate. A second CDC6 binds either at the ORC MCM complex or at a second ORC that is bound nearby. CDT1 brings a second MCM complex, which is also loaded onto the DNA. The MCM complexes are touching each other at the origin. After the two MCM complexes have been loaded onto the DNA, uh, the other proteins are not needed anymore, and so they can dissociate, and the origin is now said to be licensed. After being loaded, the MCM helicase just sit there at the origin throughout G1 phase, waiting for S phase to arrive. When the cell enters S phase, it needs to make sure that licensing of replication origins stops before DNA replication begins. Otherwise, an origin on a newly synthesized piece of DNA could be licensed, and the same DNA could be replicated more than once in the cycle. This can lead to chromosomal abnormalities, which can be very harmful to cell function. Several mechanisms contribute to preventing licensing during S phase, resulting from activation of certain cyclin-dependent kinases. I'll focus on mechanisms found in metazoans, such as humans. So, first, CDC6 is phosphorylated and exported from the nucleus to the cytosol, and therefore it is not present in the nucleus to bind to the origin recognition complex. ORC2, one of the subunits of the origin recognition complex, is phosphorylated, which reduces its affinity for chromatin. And ORC1, the largest ORC subunit, is phosphorylated, which results in its degradation. Without these, without these two subunits, the origin recognition complex is unable to form at replication origins. Also, CDT1, the protein that brings the MCM complex to the origin, is phosphorylated, which promotes its degradation. 
And there's also a protein called geminin, which is expressed in S phase, and it binds to any remaining CDT1 and prevents it from interacting with the MCM complex. Note that geminin stays in the cell through the G2 phase and M phase and is only degraded during uh, G1 phase. So as the cell starts synthesizing CDT1 again after S phase is over, geminin is still present to prevent CDT1 from bringing MCM proteins to the origin. Only in G1 phase is geminin itself degraded, which frees CDT1 for interaction with the MCM complex. These redundant mechanisms all contribute to preventing replication origins from being licensed during S phase. It may seem like overkill, but having multiple independent mechanisms makes control of this process that much more complete. After licensing of replication origins has been shut down, the kinases CDK2 and DDK become active and control activation of already licensed origins. Uh, the picture at the right shows an active eukaryotic replosome. If you look closely, you can see the MCM uh, hexamer here, associated with CDC45 and something called the GINS complex. These other proteins are required for the helicase to be active. In S phase, the MCM complex becomes phosphorylated, which results in recruitment of these other proteins to the helicase, activating it. The other proteins are required for replication, like the primase, the clamp loader, and the clamp. The single strand binding protein and DNA polymerase are recruited to the active helicase, and replication can begin. It's interesting that only about 20% of licensed replication origins become activated. One reason you might want other licensed origins in reserve waiting to go uh, is if replication is stalled because of DNA damage. If one replication fork gets stopped, the cell could activate a nearby replication origin to allow replication of the DNA from the other direction. It's thought that as replication passes a licensed but not activated replication origin, the replosome simply pushes the MCM complexes off of the DNA. So, this concludes my consideration of DNA replication. I've covered the basic process of replication, how supercoiling is created and dealt with, and the process and regulation of initiation in bacteria and eukaryotes. Thanks for watching.